Hi everyone, this is Lahiri from ABCs of Anesthesia and today we're going to go through one of those questions that get asked really commonly which is how do I get better at cannulation? So we're going to go through a few things. First of all, why is it so difficult to cannulate? But also what you need to do for preparation, a practice, deliberate practice and assessment as well as earning your own failures and then a method for gradual constant improvement and competence. So let's get started. So the usual disclaimer, now a lot of this stuff can be really high risk, so make sure you know, that you're well supervised, that it's within your scope of practice, and only do things that you're comfortable doing. Um, and especially because patients can be harmed with these techniques, there's so many ways this can go wrong, please make sure that you're very, very careful. Uh, and again, these are mostly just my opinions about things, so please take, it into, take that into consideration. Now, a lot of the stuff I'm gonna go through doesn't discount the fact that you know having great teachers and great instruction and really good setting with good equipment absolutely matters. But I'm going to go through the things that you have a bit more control over. So let's get started. So I first want to acknowledge that cannulation can actually be really tricky. I mean, it seems like one of those basic tasks, like it's a small needle, um, it's not surgery, it's not intra-arterial or deep venous and central cannulation, but still I think there's many reasons why it's a really difficult task. So we're going to go through that. You know, it's coordination of two hands and some very precise independent finger movements. You've got to factor in patient cooperation. Also, you've got to acknowledge that placing a tiny needle in a tiny vein is actually quite difficult. I mean, it's a sharp needle going into a vein often almost the same size as that needle itself. So this can be very difficult. I mean, this might not be the best analogy, but imagine you're driving a car and you're driving a car through a tunnel. And that doesn't seem too difficult, it's something that you, you know, would do many times a year. Um, but imagine that that car is actually very sharp and you're going through a tunnel that's about the same size as the car. Now replace the tunnel with some paper. You can see that that's almost an impossible equation. You're putting something very sharp into something very fragile um, and you need a lot of skill and technique and really great, great resources to be able to do this effectively. So let's go into some of that detail. Now for demonstrations on almost everything I know about IV cannulation, uh, you look at the playlist link, which should appear over there or somewhere above my head. When I was thinking about why this relatively simple-ish technique or basic techniques is so tricky, I was thinking about all the different steps that you have to do accurately. And well, I came up with a bit of a list. So for this cannula to go into a vein, you've got to do a lot of things right. So you start off by choosing the site, you put on a tourniquet, make sure it's on for the right time frame and the right tightness and it's not on for too long. Use aseptic non-touch technique, so making sure that you know you swab with Chlorhex and ethanol, you leave it on for long enough so it dries, um, then you don't touch that side again, so you keep your key sites clean and then your key parts, which means your IV is still sterile, um, your bung, your tegadem dressing, as well as the saline flush, and that's all clean. Take your cannula, make sure that it's gripped absolutely perfectly. Three fingers with the, with the pointer finger on top, and make sure that that doesn't cover the chamber so you can still see the blood flow back. Then you make sure that you're on a low angle and that angle depends on the vein and depends on other factors as well. Then you put tension on the skin, making sure that that tension, the thumb isn't in the way of lowering the needle angle. Um, you insert your cannula, make sure it's a slow measured insertion. You've got to consider the patient's comfort, patient pain. Don't change the tension on the skin, look for a flashback. Then you lower the angle. Again, you don't change the tension and you've got to think about this and hopefully that becomes muscle memory. Then you judge the distance of entry. Then you use your pointer finger to advance that plastic needle and cannula, but again, you're keeping the needle absolutely still while you're advancing the cannula, otherwise things can go wrong there. Um, and then is it in? So I'll put up a link to the video there, you know, how do you know your cannula is in? Then you remove your needle, dispose it safely, safely in a sharp spin, then you remove your tourniquet. Then you get your opposite hand to stop the blood flow back, then you put your bung on, attach the dressing, and you check that it's in with the saline flush. So when I counted all these steps, there's about 39 different steps um, that you have to do just to make sure that your cannula is in and it's absolutely gone perfect. So of course that's gonna be difficult. Now think of anything that you've ever learned with that many steps. Now maybe it was learning how to paint or create some kind of art, maybe being able to face a cricket ball hurtling down to you or you know, whatever sport you're playing with, baseball or cricket ball, maybe you're trying to shoot that three point or maybe you're rock climbing. All these multi-step tasks all are very difficult, but also they have a high risk element, just like cannulation. Now, just because cannulation is thought of as a basic task, it's worth taking very seriously. There's multiple steps, you know, risk for the patient and yourself and critical outcomes with, with success or failure. So again, a lot of things to think about and the outcome could be critical for the health of that patient. But it's a skill definitely worth learning, whether you're a paramedic, a nurse, a doctor or other healthcare professional, this skill will allow you to do so much good for your patients. So let's get into it. How can you improve at cannulation? So we'll go through preparation, 
practice and then deliberate practice and assessment, uh, owning your own failures and then concern for the patient and ways to you know, look to improve. So what I'm going to do, first of all, preparation. Now, there's obviously problems with getting the right preparation and getting everything right, but there's also solutions. So firstly, let's go through the preparation problems. So often you're going to be really busy at work. There's going to be so many tasks that you need to do. Um, you might have different equipment. You might have a patient in an odd situation or the bed height's not quite right or it, you know, it's an awkward small area that you need to work in. Whatever that is, you need to follow a few steps. So firstly, Take your time when starting out. If you're really busy, chances are you're going to rush the procedure. Make sure you've allocated time to learn that skill and have someone supervise you. Collect all your equipment. I used to go around on my ward rounds. I'd leave all the cannulations to one time if they were elective enough. And I'd just have everything set out on a tray and go from patient to patient so I could do all those tasks quickly. So have everything you know, just checklisted and make it like a bit of a production line if you have a lot of cannulas that you need to do. Um, start off with a checklist. Maybe you can't remember all of these things and I'll tell you how you can use that checklist including your equipment checklist as well as your procedural checklist. I can show you how to do that um, in the next section uh, when we talk about deliberate practice and assessment. I want you to also get familiar with your cannula. Now, if you must, you can take one out, open it from out of the pack, make sure you, you know how it moves and how it, uh, how it works because each cannula can be slightly different. You don't want your first beginner cannula uh, to be on a cannula that you're not familiar with. Something you'll hear time and time again, have your ergonomics set out. So make sure that the, you know, you, the patient might be in a room that's really crowded or small with lots of stuff. You know, there'll be trolleys and trays and equipment and medications. Uh, make sure that you have everything lined up. So because I'm, you know, because I'm right hand, I make sure that the hand is in the right angle for me to have the right trajectory. You may need to move the patient to the side of the bed. You may have to move the patient's arm out. You could even put that arm and rest it on a pillow or another structure just to keep it nice and firm and not up in the air. If you have your patient's hand up in the air with nothing below, that will make it more difficult. So make sure all of your you know, various points are absolutely stable, yourself and your patient and your patient's hand. You might want to elevate your chair or lower it or maybe elevate the bed, making sure that your arms are roughly in the right region. So I usually have everything operating with my you know, arms at right angles so it's nice and comfortable, not up here and not too far low. So that's preparation. Just make sure you do it in a relaxed way with lots of time and everything is working right for you. And if it's not, change something to make it work better for you. Now the next thing is practice. Now this is probably one of the most obvious things you'll ever hear, um, but you need lots of practice over a period of time that's short enough. So for example, if you do 100 cannulas over 10 years, that really isn't enough practice with regularity. So you need to try and manufacture these things. So the problem is, in healthcare, it's often very difficult to get these regular opportunities, especially as a junior practitioner. There's always difficult patients that the senior, pa senior person needs to be called on for. So make sure you try to find these opportunities. So the solution, especially as a junior, is to manufacture opportunities. So you know, I used to go in on my days off to get some extra practice and find where the opportunities are greatest. For example, if you're in an operating theater and they've got one case on that list, you're gonna potentially get one cannula. But if you go to um, areas of the hospital where they're doing many more cannulations, for example, radiology usually has lots of patients in the morning that need cannulas. Um, maybe you have a fast list, like a ECT list, a scope list, an eye list. You can, if you become pretty good at this, you can be an immense help to the anesthetist or your other senior staff members if you are able to do this. And it's great practice for you, and it's great for the patients because they don't get delayed as well. Now, those times when I didn't have time for practice or I didn't have the opportunity to practice, there's this thing called visualization, and a lot of athletes do this. Um, they did, funnily enough, they did a study where they had three groups of basketball players, and what they wanted to find out was whether they could improve their free throw shots through just physical practice alone, or visualization or no practice. So the three groups of these similarly uh, ranged basketball players was they measured how good they were at free throws at the start and then a week later. Now, what the first group did was they just did free throw practice. So they just got out onto the basketball court and just kept practicing. Now, the other group just visualized. So they just made sure that they were imagining sinking that ball into the, into the net. The final group didn't do any practice at all. And strangely enough, at the end of this, so after the week of practice, visualization, physical practice or no practice, they measured how good these basketball players were. And they found that the physical practice group, as well as the visualization group, did exactly the same. They had the exact same improvement. So that's pretty good evidence of the power of visualization. And it's something that I think lots of people do in the arts, in sports, and it's not necessarily that some people are told to do or trained to do in medicine and healthcare, but I would really encourage you to do that. Even in my own experience, when I've got a really difficult case that I know is gonna be high risk with lots of things going on and lots of moving parts, 
the night before, I'm always thinking about the case, even the week before, I'm thinking about how it's gonna go, I'm running the, through the procedures, through the potential crises through my mind, and this is good practice for that because it's you know, far less high risk than a high risk case to do a cannula, but it's something you can get used to visualizing as well. Now, that was practice. Lots and lots of practice in a short time frame is, the be is a really good option, but you need to make your practice deliberate practice. So the problem is, it's often f hard to find someone to supervise you and supervise you accurately. And also there's lots of opinions on how to do things and these can be real problems. So let's try to find some solutions for that. So the first thing is, you know, there's so many different ways you can cannulate effectively. I reckon just choose one way, one method and try to just, you know, recreate that method. Try to master the one appropriate method and then later on as you get better and as you get, you know, extra information, find other experts, find people to mentor you, you can change that. But at least get one system that you can do time and time again. Um, just one framework that seems pretty good. So just know that no one's method is absolutely perfect. If you've seen all of my videos, I've got a very specific method that's worked for me, and I'm not saying that's the perfect method. It's just the method that's worked for me, so please take from any of my videos what you will, um, and if you find something better, use it, but please tell me as well. I'd, I'd love to hear about new methods of doing something. Now, the one thing that I didn't do, but I do now for other tasks, is make a checklist. So, now, we had 39 steps that I, that I outlined. So if you don't have a good supervisor, you can make that checklist and even get one of your colleagues. They can look at that checklist and tick off all the steps as you do them. You can then review it after your cannulation attempt to see what things did you get and what things did you miss. And then the next time, you can focus on ensuring that you don't miss those critical points. And I think that's a really fantastic way of doing deliberate self-assessment while you're practicing. And again, that's a, that's a method of getting really good feedback when you might not have the right supervision. I'd also say at that point, go slowly. You know, I think cannulation, again, it's 39 steps. You would never ask someone to do something quickly with that many steps on their first few goes. So even though it might be you know, a little bit slower, you can always put local anesthetic for patient comfort Go slow if needed to make sure that all the steps are aligned really well and even have a look at your checklist. There's no shame in that. Just make sure that you're learning and improving constantly and you're not making the same mistakes time and time again. So the next point is to own your own failures. So I think, I think this is a really big one. Uh, the problem is you'll hear many correct and incorrect reasons for failing a cannula. And I'll put the link up below for reason why I think there's only three ways you can really fail a cannula. Um, so I think there's only three ways. It's not, it's not valves and it's not vasospasm. For example, if you didn't get a flashback because the vein you know, became smaller, the vasospasm or moved away or rolled away, that's okay. The vein will become visible, visible again. It doesn't mean you've failed completely. So that's not a reason for failure. You can still access that vein later. Again, if the vein has moved, that's okay. You can still have another go at it. Just make sure you're still sterile and everything's you know, appropriate as per your hospital protocols. Just make that vein appear again, anchor it better, or reposition your cannula so that you get the right angle of insertion. Yeah, so my solution is to watch the videos and find a method that's robust and think, why did I fail? So if you fail, just make sure it's for the, you know it's for the correct reason and not for a made up reason, you know, which is essentially, did I advance the cannula far enough? Or if it didn't, did I advance the cannula too far and it went through another wall? And that's it really. If you, the only ways you can fail once you've got a flashback are you didn't advance it far enough or you advanced it too far. So if you know it's one of those things, learn from that mistake and then move on. So I think failure gets a bad rap. For example, you would never, you know, criticize an infant who is trying to walk and then just ends up falling time and time again. That's just part of the process. The only way you get to success, especially in difficult tasks, is constant failure and constant improvement. And you'll find that, you know, it's absolutely fine. No matter how good you get at this, there'll always be points to improve, especially the more complex the task gets. You know, anesthesia is so complex, surgery is so complex, so many things in healthcare are so complex that you'll be just constantly improving and it's, and it's absolutely okay. Um, just do it with the right supervision and make sure that you've got the right help on board. Failure is really the only path to competence. Just make sure that these failures are controlled and supervised and within your scope. Now, something that happened time and time again for me was con concern for the patient. So I found that if the patient was unusually distressed or absolutely distressed by the cannulation attempt, that would increase my rate of failure. So the problem is IV cannulation can be very painful and distressing for some patients. Some patients have needle phobia, maybe they've had repeated attempts by other people, maybe they've got chronic pain or any other factors, stress, anxiety, depression, all of these things could be going on, especially during a hospital stay. So you've got to think that this patient is going through some really tough stuff. Um, and that feeling that the patient is suffering makes it really tough for me to insert that cannula, knowing that they're in that much pain. And I found that, that really difficult, and you might as well. So look, the solution is, is not an easy one. I mean, I think first of all, if you're starting out, don't learn on the most difficult veins. You know, take the opportunity to observe experts 
doing you know the, the cannulations are the most difficult veins and that way you can learn from that as well um, but yeah if you've got a really difficult vein of patients with severe chronic pain syndromes or any other multiple attempts and you're a beginner probably not the best one to do a cannula on now i've got a video um, up here of how to put local anesthetic in. Again, this is make sure this is within your scope of practice, but local anesthetic with a really tiny hypodermic needle, 27 gauge or 30 gauge, um, is a really good way of getting rid of patient's pain. And just remember, to, you know, some people would say that two punctures is worse than one, but if that first puncture is with a 30 gauge needle, um, just before you're about to put an 18 gauge, 16 or a 14 gauge, which are really big needles, trust me, your patient's gonna feel far less pain. And one of the side effects of that is it'll, it'll improve your confidence a lot. The fact that your patient isn't moving in pain and not grimacing, and after you get the cannulation, cannulation attempt in, the patient tells you that they didn't feel a thing and that's the first time they haven't felt pain on cannulation, you'll feel really good about yourself. So I have a low threshold, especially in difficult patients, to put local anesthetic in the skin before I insert the cannula. So that's most of the tips I have, but the final one is constantly look to improve and make yourself better, whether it's cannulation or any other task. So the problem is, once you get competence at the easier veins, you'll need to extend yourself because not every vein is gonna be easy and for sure you're gonna be in a, in a situation where you need to put a very difficult cannula in. So, you know, these difficult situations, just think about that. Large volume resuscitation, um, you might need to put, you know, in a trauma patient or a patient who had massive blood loss in theater, you may have to put a 18, 16 or even 14 gauge in and that is a very difficult skill. Patients may have impossibly difficult veins, small veins, tortuous veins, and often for my ECT list, ophthalmology list, especially elderly patients, chemotherapy patients, obese patients, uh, people with swelling, nephrotic syndrome, heart failure, they're incredibly difficult. I use all the techniques outlined in my video and I just have to be far more careful with them. You may have awkward sites, uh, there may be altered positions on the back of the forearm or peripheral sites that you haven't really been familiar with. Maybe the cubital fossa is difficult for you. Whatever it is, that might be an issue. Maybe the position of the patient is difficult. Like, you know, if you work in a hospital and you're doing anesthetics or any kind of resus role, you'll be going in to look after patients in tiny rooms, in lounge rooms with chairs and couches everywhere, maybe even in the shower where a patient's collapsed. These awkward positions are very difficult uh, when it comes to crisis cannulation. And then finally, uncooperative patients. Like, you know, you work, you work long enough, often you'll have a patient who's intoxicated with alcohol or drugs, maybe you've got a patient who's delirious or a pediatric patient, and each of these situations means that not only do you have to get those 39 steps absolutely spot on, but now you've got a moving target or a difficult target, and that's a whole other talk in itself. So the principle I try to apply to this is practice what is difficult while it's easy. Practice the difficult situations when the situation itself isn't difficult or not critical. That way you can have the adequate supervision and you don't have to extend yourself too far. For example, if you do have an elective patient with a nice big vein, under supervision, why not put a large cannula? You know, start, if you're starting with 22s, next time try a 20 gauge or an 18 gauge and soon you'll work up to 16 and 14 gauges in these patients knowing that you'll be able to get them. Once you're very, very comfortable at doing large cannulation, 14 gauge cannulation in elected patients when you're not under stress, then when the time comes and you really need that 14 gauge in for that resuscitation, you'll be absolutely on point. Um, so again, practice what is hard while it's easy, practice what's difficult when it's not difficult or not critical. Maybe, you, again, you've got an elective situation and a patient's got one really good vein and one slightly smaller vein. Why not go for the smaller vein if it's appropriate? Or maybe try a difficult site. Maybe go for a tortuous vein to learn how to angulate along the longest axis that's still straight. Uh, maybe if, if, you know, if you are in a recess, engage the awkward position and try to make it as best as possible. Um, you know, I remember there's plenty of times I was called for uncooperative patients and instead of saying, no, nah, that's, that's too difficult and it's not, not possible, try to, try to be that point of help for that patient get your staff involved. You might even need security for really difficult situations and have the patient's arms and limbs fixated um, safely and appropriately and then try to, um, you know, try to cannulate safely. Again, a lot of this stuff is some high-end stuff to think about for later, but we keep looking to improve because it's, it's such a rewarding task at the end of the day. So that's all I really wanted to go through, um, you know, how to become be better at cannulation. We went through why is cannulation so difficult, preparation, regular practice, deliberate practice and assessment, the patient and you know, patient concerns, um, and then owning your own failures and how to you know, manufacture gradual improvement and increasing your competence. Now I'm sure there's so many of you who are out there who've got some really good tips on how to improve cannulation. Please put it in the comments below. I'd love to hear what you have to say um, and share this video with anyone who might be interested. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you for the next video.